amen, amen. Tonight I'm going to be talking about baggage claim. Who enjoys going to the baggage claim at the airport? It's risky business, right? You're like, all right, baggage claim. I am hoping that my bag is going to be there, right? And you go through like the little carousel thing and the bags keep going by and there's just like a ton of bags that look exactly like yours, but you're like, I don't have a pink leopard piece of string on mine and then they keep going by and they keep going by and now you're getting nervous because you've been here for like two minutes and there's only like four bags left on the carousel and you're like, my bag better be here. And then, thank the Lord, one falls out of the chute at the end and you're like, yes, it's mine. Anybody been there? Anybody gotten, has anybody ever had their luggage, uh, not stolen, but like lost by the airline? Anyone? Show of hands. Okay, okay. Has it, who, has, who in here has never been to the airport, never flown in an airplane, anything like that? Man, y'all do not know the stress level that y'all are missing out on. It is, do not go to the doctor right after flying, because they're going to be like, your heart rate is it non-existent. You don't have a heart. It's so high. Um, yeah, so, man, airports, just, it's a wild ride. If you ever get a chance to fly an airplane, do it. It's great. Airport, not so much, right? The act of flying is awesome. The process to get there, not the best, not the best. So I think it's important that we as believers determine the difference between baggage that we have and bondage that we have. There's a difference between baggage, right? This is baggage right here. This is an old suitcase. Who, who in here actually used this suitcase to travel and not just to decorate your house with? Anyone show of hands? Show of hands. Some? Okay. Yep. This one b- belonged to somebody with the initials OMB. So, that has nothing to do with my sermon, but I just figured I'd share it with you. So, there's a difference between baggage and bondage that we carry. Okay? Now, tonight, hopefully I'll show you that God can use your baggage if you give it to him. You were never meant to hold on to bondage, but there's times and seasons in life when you have to hold on to your baggage. Baggage isn't a bad thing. Bondage is bad. Airplanes are great, amazing. The process of flying, you like get up in the air, your ears feel weird, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, you check your bag. Most of the time you try and um, have the carry-on. There's two options that you have whenever you fly. Either you can check your luggage, your baggage, or you can have the carry-on baggage. And it has to be like a certain size, weight, proportions, all those things. And so the experienced flyer knows that if you want to have any of your supplies that you need whenever you get to the next destination, what do you do with your carry-on? You get what? (laughs) The essentials. It is amazing how little you actually need whenever you fly. Now, if you fly with Leslie, my wife, love you, babe, we'll fly for, it will be gone for like three days, okay? And every time at the baggage claim desk, if we check baggage, they're like, your bag is 15 pounds over the limit. And they give you a lot. Like, it's like 70 pounds. I mean, it's like a little human, like, weight that they give you. And I'm like, how? (laughs) We're literally going to come back tomorrow. How do we have this much stuff? in a checked baggage, right? So, you always try and pack the essentials, the necessities in your carry-on, right? So, uh, f- you know, for, if you're like me, the necessities in the carry-on is, uh, you know, shoe, an extra pair of shoes, um, your undergarments, you know, uh, what is it, uh, deodorant, maybe travel deodorant, toothpaste, uh, those kind of things, huh? Yeah, the, t- the small ones, you can't take the big ones. I don't, it's just because, well, anyway, I'm not going to go there. Um, Also, you know, you bring your book, you bring your book on the airplane so that the 70 people on the airplane you're flying with can know that you're a reader, that you, that you read all the time and you do not have (laughs) enough time to read your book once you get to your destination. So not to waste time, you read, of course, anyone, anyone with me on that? You read all the time, especially when you're on an airplane, though. If you're like me, 
I pretty much just read <laughs> when I get on the airplane. But I have my book, and I, like, hold it up so that everybody sees and be like, I'm reading, reading a book, becoming knowledgeable, no big deal. And then if you are a really experienced flyer, you remember your, um, your headphones, right? The headphones, necessity, crying babies, you know, the neighbor beside you asks if you can have your armrest, and you're like, well, I can't, what? I'm sorry. And then you get the armrest. Y'all know what I'm talking about, selfish. Um, and then um, the, neck, the neck pillow, you know, you need the neck pillow on the plane. Um, the really, ex- like, you know, whenever you're flying with a person that, like, flies every day for their job, because they may have, like, a little backpack, and then the neck pillow, and they, like, sleep like this. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? They sleep forward. And you're like, how is that even a thing? And then about halfway through the flight, you're like, man, I wish I was that person, right? So, you know, there's just, there's different varying levels of people who are used to flying. Now, if you've never flown an airplane, uh, watch a movie. They may show you what it's like, but it is an experience to fly in an airplane. My flyers in here, am I telling the truth? It is, it is always an experience. So, normal process You check in the baggage that's too big to fit on the airplane with you. But what happens to that baggage when you check it in to the airline? They take it onto the plane with you, right? Supposed to, yeah. That's whenever, you know, I was talking about like your prayer being the last line of defense. That's like your first line of offense. Some of y'all don't pray as much as you pray in an airport regularly because you're like, Lord, protect this luggage. Send a head, a shrub of protection around this bag. Y'all are like praying for it more than, anyway. Um, so there is a process. You got to check that luggage or that baggage in, right? But you don't need that huge stuff while you're traveling to your destination. But when you get to your destination, guess what? That baggage becomes very very important. Don't believe me? Lose your check-in. Lose your checked luggage one time on a trip, and it's going to be chaos, right? You're like, I can't sleep. I can't change my clothes. Right? It's just a bad experience overall. So you don't want to lose that baggage. You just don't need it while you're traveling to get to where you need to go. But once you get to where you need to go, you may need the stuff in your baggage, it may help somebody, the stuff in your baggage, when you get there, right? So, normal sermon, we've heard it all, right? We've heard this sermon before. You got to let God take your baggage. You got to let him take it. And then at the altar call, you're like, yeah, yeah, I have this baggage. I'm going to leave it up here at the altar. Here you go, here you go, God. Here's my baggage. There's all my baggage. I no longer have baggage. I am a free person. That lasts for about 30 minutes until you get back out in the car and you get the text message from your friend or your wife says something or you get home and your dog tore up all the stuff in the house and you're like, where did my baggage go? Right? All of a sudden, it's right back with you. It's like, rewind, never happened. Here's my baggage. And I'm lugging my baggage again. But what happens whenever we let Jesus take our baggage the right way? Do you think he can use it? I think he can. So sometimes we hear that sermon and we're we're like, preach. Yeah, get rid of that baggage. You don't need that baggage. And that's when you're in the air, right? And then you get to the baggage claim at the end of the conference or the camp. wherever you're And you have to go back out into the real world. And you say, where's my baggage? And the, the airline says, hmm, somewhere between you checking this in and in the air, and I don't, I and mean, it seems simple, but it's really a complex process. We got a lot of numbers we got to check. And then, you know, you get to the baggage claim person, and you're like, oh, it's okay. I love you. Is there anything I can pray for you about? Let's all have, who, need, who in here needs prayer, right? Anybody respond that way? No. You're like, you what? You lost my baggage? How dare you, Right? You know how much I played? I paid for this plane ticket? And they're like, we'll offer you $200 in free airline tickets. And it's like, that will only get half of us to where we need to go, right? It's not even, 
helping my partner that I traveled with, for me, you know, Leslie, it's always good to let you know where your baggage is, right? But what do we do with this baggage? We all have baggage of some sort. Young people sitting here, I know for a fact you guys have baggage. Some of you have more baggage than others. Uh, Our adults have baggage, right? Anybody have baggage? Hey, it's okay. I think it was uh, Paul said, if I boast, I boast in my weakness, right? So, hey, I got baggage. Who in here has baggage? Okay, so look around. Ten seconds ago, everybody was like, I don't know if I should raise my hand. And then everybody in here had baggage, and everyone raised their hand, and now we all know we have baggage, okay? Everybody has a baggage. So, uh, your baggage is important for your destination, not necessarily the journey you're taking. You'll need your baggage at the destination, not necessarily during your journey. So spiritually speaking, what could be some of our baggage? Just shout it out. What could be some baggage that somebody has? If you know the baggage your neighbor has, go ahead and shout out their baggage. Don't shout out your baggage. Shout out their baggage. Anyone brave enough? Youth, youth, what are some of the things that could be baggage? Stuff that weighs you down. Stuff that you carry with you. What? Peer pressure. That's a great one. Pride. What? Fear. Anger. Mowage. Mowage is what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what else? We got anything else? Those are some good ones. Finances. This is getting real over here. Some of y'all were like, um, um, pr- not praying enough. No job family issues oh boy now we're talking about you have to get both of those uh baggage right there they they definitely it'll be over the weight limit with the family baggage for sure anybody else have any baggage i'll take one more past sins addictions good baggage we got some good baggage in here so the crazy thing is is that pretty much every story in the bible talks about Baggage. There was only one perfect person in the Bible. Who was it? Jesus. Every other story in the Bible was talking about people having baggage and not making the cut. David couldn't make the cut. Elijah couldn't make the cut. Elisha couldn't make the cut. Solomon couldn't make the cut. Oh, who's like a really obscure one that will make me sound really spiritual? Nebuchadnezzar, I don't know, right? (laughs) Story after story after story was about people not making the cut. Jesus' disciples, his 12 closest friends. First of all, it's a miracle that Jesus was in his 30s and had 12 friends, okay? Secondly, his friends messed up all the time. You remember that story when Jesus is like, get behind me, Satan? He's talking to his friend, he didn't like pull him over to the corner and be like, now we got to talk about some things. You're like saying things that I can't do. You can't promise all these people this stuff. If you would just calm down. What are you tweeting about? Why, is the, why are you tweeting that stuff? That's modern day Jesus. But he just says it. They're like walking down the street. All the people around him are like, Jesus, heal me. And he's like, get behind me, Satan, to one of his followers. And it's, what, is his, what does his friend do? I cannot believe he said that about me. He just, did y'all hear him, did y'all hear him call me Satan? What are you going to do? It's Jesus, right? You're going to be like, hey, you're wrong, psych. No, you can't do that. You can't do that, right? If anybody knows who Satan is, it's Jesus, right? I don't know about you, but I'd be worried at that point. I'd be like, am I really? Is it me? Oh, my gosh. I have to quit, right? So Jesus' followers messed up all the time. The closest people that Jesus messed up, you think you're going to mess up? Yes, I know you're going to mess up. Newsflash, you're going to mess up. Sorry, I'm going to mess up. All God's children are going to mess up. But it's not about us messing up. It's about what Jesus did for us. Amen? So we're going to go back to John uh, chapter 20, verse 4. Is it John? Is it 21? What do you have on the computer? Is it 21? 
That one's right. Uh, is it 20? Yeah, John 21. Verse 4, starting in verse 4. Let's start there. I'll match it up, see if I'm right. Do, do, do. Yes. Yes, we're right. Okay, I was wrong. You were right. See? Guess what? Set it up. I messed up. That was not a setup. However, played it off real nice. All right, let's go. John chapter 21, verse 4. At, John, at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. So the disciples, uh, it actually says seven of the disciples, went back out into the Sea of Galilee to fish at night. Okay? Fishing at night. So Jesus is standing on the beach after they've fished all night long in the dark. Morning comes. Jesus was on the beach. The disciples couldn't see who he was. In verse 5, he called out, Fellows, have you caught any fish? What did they say? No. No. Zero. Zilch. Not a, right? Fish all night. No fish. Verse 6, then he said, throw out your net onto the right-hand side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. In verse 7, then the disciples or then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he had stripped for work. That means he was naked. It's in the Bible. I'm just saying, it's in the Bible. Jumped into the water and headed to shore. The others stayed with the boat and pulled the loaded net to the shore, for they were only about 100 yards from the shore. In verse 9, when they got there, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire, and some bread. In verse 10, bring some of the fish you just caught, Jesus said. So Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net to the shore. There were 153 large fish, and yet the net hadn't torn. Now come and have some breakfast, Jesus said. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. In verse 14, this was the third time. The third time. Jesus had appeared to his disciples since he had been raised from the dead. Okay. So the disciples, with Jesus before he dies on the cross, Jesus gets arrested, goes to the cross. Jesus says, in three days, I'll die and I'll raise again. And I'll, you will be my disciples and you will go throughout all the world. And you will preach the good news. And then what did Jesus say to the disciples when he like first met him, like rewind three years ago. Jesus like meets the disciples. They're out there fishing. What does Jesus say? Follow me, and I will get, I'll help you catch so many fish you can't pull the net into your boat. No. What do you say? Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. The disciples see Jesus die. It's been about two weeks after Jesus' death, and they go out at night in the cover of darkness, naked, and go back to what they knew before they knew Jesus and they weren't even good at it right they did not catch a single fish didn't catch one fish all night zero fish morning comes Jesus is like what's up fellows how do you do fellow citizens right nobody nobody recognizes him from 100 yards away and he's like hey I have an idea throw that net on the other side of the boat how many of you know that this the skilled like hardened fishermen are like, are you kidding me? We're 100 yards from the shore. The net is probably going to go six inches deep because the shore is so short or the water is so short. We've been out here all night. Our hands are all torn up from this net. I am so tired. The sun's coming up. I don't have breakfast, right? Jesus tells them, hey, throw that, throw that net on the other side of the boat. They didn't move. They didn't change boats. They didn't change nets. They didn't change their strategy. They just did what Jesus told them to do. And what happens? 153 fish? No, large fish. <laughs> they got not only 153 fish, 153 large fish. Okay? So, in the middle of this happening, this is the third time Jesus has appeared to them since his death. And what are the disciples still doing? give you a hint. Not what Jesus told them to do. Right? 
they've, Jesus has already appeared to them, risen from the dead two other times. And they still went back to what they knew before Jesus. How many times has Jesus told you to do something? And you went back to what you knew. And how fruitful was it? Zero fish, all night, tired, dog tired, right? A hundred yards from shore, about to get back to shore. And he goes, just, there's still a net on the other side. Okay, here we go. Oh my, God, right? All night and in 10 seconds, they catch 153 fish. That's what Jesus can do. So the disciples mess up again. They return to fish for fish rather than fishing for men. But does Jesus condemn them? No, he cooked them breakfast. The thing that they were fishing for that they didn't catch any of, Jesus already had a fire going with the fish ready for him. If we obey what God has told us to do, he will supply all of our needs way above what we could ever ask, think, or imagine. But the crazy thing is, is that he asks for their fish. He doesn't say, your fish is not is not good enough. You disobeyed me, right? He includes what they could do in the overall portion of what he had already provided for them. God can take your disobedience and turn it into his good. In other words, God can take the nets that have you caught and catch more than you can ever imagine in the same net. Not moving anything, not changing the boat, not changing your, uh, your position, not changing churches, not leaving your spouse, not walking out on your family. Uh-oh. Same situation, same circumstance, same baggage that they knew he knew they were going to go back to it, and he still used it for his good. So, if he can do that with somebody who had seen him die and raise from the dead twice before, third time, they've seen a ghost. First time you see a ghost, you're probably like, hmm, was that just me? Or second time you see a ghost with witnesses, you're probably like, I think this is a real thing. The third time you see a ghost and he's real and there's other people there, definitely, definitely a real thing, right? So he says to him in verse six, throw out your net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. You see, what happens whenever Jesus takes over is it's out of our own power. He gives us so much more than we can even handle. If you feel overwhelmed right now, it's because Jesus is about to step in. If you feel like you can't deal with the situation, that you can't handle it, that you've been fishing all night in the buff and nothing happened, trust me, somebody's been there before. <laughs> and Jesus is right on the horizon. The darkness has gone. The morning is come. And he's got 153 fish waiting for you. He also had time to cook breakfast. Y'all know how hard it is to cook breakfast? Now imagine that on the seashore with charcoal. That's tough, guys. I can barely do it on my stove. So point number one, Jesus uses our baggage to heal us, not hinder us. He'll use your baggage to heal you, not hinder you. So it's just like taking your bag before you get on the plane, right? You don't need your baggage while you're traveling on the plane. But taken care of the right way, put in the right place with people who are trained to take care of your baggage. When you get to your destination, they hand you your baggage back and they go, here you go. And you say, thank you. That's the, uh, the ideal situation, right? Hopefully they don't lose it. Here you go. Here's your baggage bag. Because I didn't need it for the cramped plane. 
the process of getting me to where I needed to be, but I do need it for where I'm supposed to be, for where God's called me to be. So when we take our baggage to Jesus, it looks a little something like this. There's always another side to the story, isn't there? Left side, no fish, nothing going on, didn't catch fish all night. Other side of the boat, first cast, terrible conditions, worst place, everything going on, right? More fish than they could handle. Just seeing the other side of the issue. So we get our baggage. We get to where we're going, right? Oh, man, our baggage may look something like this. Anybody ever failed at something? So God says, hey, how about you throw that on the right side of the boat or on my side of the boat, maybe? Hey, why don't you give that to me? And he turns it into something like this. A future, right? He's given us a future and a hope. I'm going to set this one over here. Maybe somebody needs to know that their failure, failures don't determine their future. Okay, here we go. We got another one. Left side of the boat, fished all night in the darkness. Maybe we are filled with shame. We're naked, right? We're exposed. Everything's gone wrong. Everything. Can't even catch a fish. The only thing we know how to do, can't even do that. But Jesus may turn it into shameless. So I didn't, also this is not my penmanship. I had to call in the big leagues. Thanks babe, love you. So, shameless. I'm going to set this like way over here maybe. Okay. So we can take our shame, clothe us, get us back to where we need to be. Or maybe your baggage looks something like this. You're a prodigal. You've been running away from the Father. You did all the things that the world told you to do, and it left you in a pig pen, eating slop. You know what Jesus can do? Hey, throw this on the other, the right side of the boat. And turn it into a party, right? I love parties. I love them. Parties are awesome. In the right context, parties are awesome. Jesus also loved parties. Do you know what they called Jesus in the Bible? What other people thought Jesus was? They thought he was a drunkard because he went to so many parties. Guys, he was only on earth for 33 years. He's like, I'm going to live life. Y'all can keep judging. I'm going to be over here partying, right? So maybe, maybe you're a prodigal. Maybe you feel like a prodigal and you didn't know that there's a party waiting on you in the kingdom. This one's pretty all-encompassing, right? We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have caught no fish, zero. And what does Jesus do? He's just roasting some salvation over some charcoal, right? The very thing that we didn't have enough of, he's already prepared for us, right? So... Salvation, that's a big one. So when we get to our destination and we start pulling stuff out of our bags, we have to remember there's always another side. What the devil meant to harm you, what the devil meant to kill you, what the devil meant to keep you distracted all night fishing for nothing, Jesus says, hey, I'm going to turn this all around and about. 3.2 3.2 seconds. Throw it on the right side. You don't have to change the way you're going about it. You don't have to change what's in your hands. You don't have to change anything about it. You know why? Because Jesus has already done it for you. All you have to do is listen and obey. Obedience. So, point number two. Jesus takes our mistakes and turns them into a miracle. How many of y'all know (laughs) beyond the shadow of a doubt it is a miracle you're sitting here tonight? 
I, my hand's raised because I know for a fact it's a miracle I'm sitting here tonight. Remember that thing about the parties? Y'all, by the grace of God. In myself, I am way too weak. But with Jesus, if I listen to him, if I, if I correct my baggage and I use it for good, guess what? I have what I need whenever Jesus calls me, right? So we can't get rid of our past. We can't get rid of our baggage. We can't. It says you're called a new creation. It doesn't say anything about new baggage, <laughs> right? You see, you're stuck with that. And I feel like a lot of times we miss the point whenever a pastor or somebody gets up here and goes, you got to get rid of your baggage. It's awful. It's nasty. It's the worst. You're the worst. And you're like, but I, just, I didn't know at the time, right? I just went back to what I knew to do. And if Jesus didn't condemn them, what are we doing condemning people? We, who gave us the right? Jesus didn't. <laughs> Again, if Jesus knew who Satan was, He'd probably know who to forgive and who not to forgive. Not us. So if we take our baggage and we use it for what Jesus needs us to use it for, it will always work out. Jesus always answered in grace and in truth. Right? He always answered in grace and in truth. So the graceful part of Jesus was he had breakfast prepared for him. He knew they'd been out all night. Knew they didn't have any fish. <laughs> Right? He had the bread and the fish prepared for him, probably some coffee. I don't know, mad living here. I'd have coffee. If it were me, I would have coffee there. So Jesus prepared breakfast for him while they were disobeying him. He didn't wait till they got to shore and went, Mm hmm, I see you. Had to put your cloak back on. What are you doing out there fishing? What's that about? He didn't drag them through the mud again. They knew exactly what they were doing. He just said, hey, why don't you bring me some of those big fish? These are just some fish I found. Bring me some of those big fish. I'm cooking this breakfast for you. Hey, guys, what's up? Missed you. What are you doing out here, right? Later in the story, Jesus asks him, he says, do you love me? One of the disciples says, well, yes, of course. Of course, Jesus, I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He's like, okay, so do what you're doing right now for all the other people. Jesus says, do you love me? He said, yes, of course. Two more times, he tells him, he says, feed my sheep. So Jesus wasn't worried about their baggage, and neither should we. He picked up right where they left off. He didn't worry about what they had been through. He didn't worry about what they ran back to. He said, I'm here now. I'm taking your baggage. I'm taking the things that were meant for your harm, and I'm turning them back into good. Go feed my people. The ones that had seen him three times after he had been raised from the dead and still disobeyed him, he entrusted with them. He said, you go feed my sheep. You know how powerful this, one of this last commands of Jesus is, it's 2018 and we're talking about this story right now. This happened over 2,000 years ago. You wanna talk about getting a word from God? You wanna talk about hearing the voice of God? Open your Bible. The voice of God is alive in the word of God. If Jesus was the word made flesh, every story about Jesus is the Bible. And if we're to be reading God's word so that we can renew our mind, imagine what we could do if we truly knew the power of God's word. Jesus knew that he didn't have long, but he knew that if he could correct him at this moment, how powerful it would be. Again, 2,000 years later, we're talking about grilled fish. After they had messed up again and again and again. So point number three, what baggage have you not checked with Jesus? What baggage have you not checked with Jesus? If the worship team will start making their way back up. What have you not checked 
What have you hidden away? What have you been doing at night in the darkness? The familiarity, the things that you go back to, the things that you need for whenever God has called you to go where you need to go. But if you don't have any baggage, what are you going to do when you get there? What are you going to use? God is calling you not to worry about baggage in the negative sense, but to worry about the people that need what you've been through when you go to minister to them. If you've never been through anything, how are you going to help anybody through anything? Now, if we say, oh, this, but this right here, this is my baggage. Let's not talk about that. I, I left that at an altar <laughs> in, in 1972, 1976, 1981, 1985, 1990. That was a good year. Uh, you, you will never get rid of your baggage. You can't. Your life is a part of you. Everything you've done is a part of you. Now, if you keep doing the things that hold you back, that's bondage. If you take your baggage with you, God can use it for his good. In Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. So we come to the check-in counter and we give the airline our bag right and it's Jesus standing there and he goes give me give me that luggage you have a journey to go on you have a destination to get to and if you hold on to this while you're going through your journey you'll never get to your destination I'm going to take this for you but (laughs) I promise you it'll be waiting for you on the other side I can guarantee that Right? So, he says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I'll give you rest. Verse 29, take my yoke upon you. What? That doesn't sound very free. (laughs) A yoke? Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. So growing up, I would read that passage of scripture in like verse 30. I'd be like, for my yoke is easy to bear. Great. Thanks, Lord. Love you. But I forget about that second part where it says, and the burden I give you is light. How can a burden be light? Maybe your baggage is meant for a higher purpose than you know right now. And when you get to your destination, you're going to need to open it. And you're going to need to show all these people that are dealing with all kinds of issues that they have a purpose. They have a future. Look at me. I was here when I left the airport. I went up 30,000 feet up. I got rid of all the baggage. Now I'm back here to let you do the same thing. And if we let us hold somebody else back if we if we return to what we know when God's telling us to go do something for somebody else that's not good right so I think we've read that passage wrong it's not that Jesus doesn't give us a yoke or a burden it's that he gives us the right yoke he gives us the right burden life's not meant to not have a yoke not have a burden you're to have a burden for lost souls when you walk into a hospital and there are 10,000 beds full of sick children that's a burden you're not meant to not feel that when you walk into your schools guys and you see boys walking around as girls and girls walk around as boys And some so confused, they don't know if they're a boy or a girl. That's your burden. That's your yoke. It's for Christ that we've been, it's for freedom that we've been set free. There are people that have not been set free yet. They're walking around in the darkness. They're throwing their nets out. (laughs) They're not catching anything. And 
All we have to do is show them the right way to do it. Look, I got baggage. My past sucks. It's awful. (laughs) But my future. Amen? But my future. And you can have the same thing. You can have the same thing. It's called a testimony, guys. It's called a testimony. It's a yoke is easy and his burden is light. Doesn't mean you're not going to have one. It means that he's going to put the right one on you. To save souls. To see people healed. To see people delivered. To see people set free. To see families healed. To see fathers return to their sons. All those things. Those are the burdens and the yokes that he's going to put on you. So, you got baggage? Good. You only know how to return to what you did before Christ knew you? Just keep holding on. The morning's coming. He's going to be right there when the dawn breaks. Thank you.